So when I was nine years old, um, I had a $5 a week allowance. And with that allowance, I was able to buy this book. It was called Wildlife Alert. I still have it, it's still on my shelf. It's still, uh, it's still pretty amazing. And in this book, it, it talked to me about the species that were going extinct here in the United States. It was the black-footed ferret, it was the Florida key deer and the Florida panther. It was this amazing bird, this huge bird called the California condor, which had gotten down to 27 individuals and it was about to go extinct and they, were, they actually pulled it out of the wild. And that terrified me. The thought that a single species, our own, could actually drive these species extinct. So I decided that at that point when I was nine, to spend the rest of my life focused on extinction and actually started this company, Conservations X Labs, whose mission is to end human-induced extinction. Bit of a lofty goal, but we thought we'd go after it. So as an undergrad, we have this incredible thing that's here on the Duke campus. It's a Duke Lemur Center. It's the only kind of its own. And, and I was able to take a course uh, that talked to me about lemurs and then go to Madagascar with this professor who was here who literally that summer won the MacArthur Genius Award uh, for work on conservation. Ten years later, I would come back to Madagascar to do my PhD, which was to understand this fundamental behavior of extinction, and particularly among 12 species of lemurs. And one of the things you may not hear about lemurs is the boredom. The boredom of after you've darted a lemur that's high up in the trees and then waiting for three hours for it to fall asleep and fall into your net. That's what the picture is about. But it's also to recognize that there was an unbelievable amount of diversity, that 80% of the plants and animals on Madagascar are found nowhere else, and we're still discovering them. In 2012, they announced the discovery of four new species of chameleon, including this one, which is the world's smallest, Brachycia micro. But even more important was the recognition that lemurs, primates, when I had left Madagascar in 2003, that there were 45 known species of lemurs at that time, and at present, there's 105 lem species of lemurs. We've doubled the amount of species that's on that single island. I got addicted. I had worked with my professor setting up a national park in, in Madagascar that I had done my PhD on the outside of. I got addicted to this process of setting up national parks. I got a job with the Wildlife Conservation Society, you guys know them perhaps as the Bronx Zoo, to set up the first national park in Afghanistan. And you might wonder, what is actually in Afghanistan? Um, well, Afghanistan, at least even up to 50 years ago, had more cat species than all of Africa. As much as it was a cultural Silk Road, it was a biological Silk Road that united the flora and the fauna of Europe, of Asia, and Africa. There were hyenas in Afghanistan as well as brown bears in, a, in that single country. And it became, this is a picture of a Persian leopard that we had on one of our camera traps. It was clearly not very happy to have its picture taken. The second national park the team in Afghanistan set up was in 2012. And this was at the western end of the Himalayas. This was a legendary area. This place was so remote. It was next to something called the Eurasian Pole of Inaccessibility. And, and, and it, it, it exists, you can look it up. But uh, what was spectacular about this region was this was the pathway that Marco Polo took through Asia. This was the pathway, he actually described one of the sheep species in the area, these amazing things called Marco Polo sheep, who's, who have horns that are six feet long if you follow the curve. And in this area, we also have snow leopards, which we were able to get some of the first camera traps and verify that after three decades of war, that they still persisted. But there's a problem we have as conservationists. The mere creation of national parks, of which we've been exponentially successful at doing, it has been really insufficient to stop the current six mass extinction event that we're in the middle of. The, the rate of extinction at present is a thousand times that of background extinction rates, the normal rates of extinctions we've seen in the geologic record. And in fact, we've probably over, es, underestimated it by a factor of 10 because the very species that we like to study, right, which are commonly distributed, uh, distributed across a variety of habitats that are easily found, that are not located in really tiny specialized habitats at night, are those species that have the very characteristics of adaptability that would allow them to survive extinction. 95% of the species we've never really assessed for their extinction rate. 
And in my own beloved Madagascar, 90% of the forest has disappeared. We're losing species before we even know that they exist. And this situation is probably gonna get worse. We have 9.6 billion people on this planet expected by 2050, and that requires 70% more food, not to mention doubling or tripling nitrogen, phosphorus, water, and pesticide use to grow that food. And this is coupled with the fact that we've got billions of people emerging into middle class who want more meat and dairy. So what does 70% more food look like? Well, that, it, it will take a billion hectares to grow that food. That is an area of new land that is equal to the United States. And what that means is we're gonna clear the Congo Basin and the Amazon forest to be able to feed those people, unless we come up with a better solution. So, if you can't tell, I am the absolute worst person to invite to dinner, right? I will just kill your dinner party like no one else can do with the myriad of facts, right? I am a conservation biologist, which means my discipline exists to describe and mourn the passing of species, right? I am, I'm part of a society of professional mourners, but the fact is, this doesn't have to be the case. And it requires us to think about conservation in some different ways. And one of the things, one of the reasons we can be optimistic is what I call this democratization of science and technology. We are in a period of time, and you saw Girls Engineering for Change, where we have access to technology, the smartphones in our, in our pockets, which are amazing connected sensors and supercomputers, and the ability to actually address these problems like never before. Advances in artificial intelligence and computer vision so your Uber doesn't have to have a driver, coupled with the advances in, in molecular sciences that's allowing us to edit the genome as if it was a Microsoft Word document. And these things in some ways are scary, right? We've seen what that, that has done to our populace, I think, over the last few months. But the fact is, they're also tools. And they're tools that we have to consider uh, for conservation. And part of the issue of conservation is we've got to actually get away from linear solutions. We've got to focus on the revolutionary rather than the evolutionary. And in particular, we've got to stop addressing the symptoms of conservation. National parks, right, which reflect de or a bulwark against deforestation, deforestation is a symptom. The reasons behind that deforestation are the causes. And we gotta spend more time actually thinking about what those causes are and how we address them. And one example is replacement. And I wanna talk about some entrepreneurs, not NGOs, not, not, not pure academics, but entrepreneurs who are actually trying to take on this problem. This is a company that actually is called Pembient. It was founded by two founders, one of which was Matthew Marcus, who is a serial entrepreneur, who said, I want to do something about the poaching of rhinos. We're about to poach them off, off existence on this planet. And so he reverse engineered the DNA of rhino horn, which is essentially the same material that makes your hair, and then sought to produce that rhino horn himself. He actually did something else. He did a market test to see if there would be demand for his product. And in the process of doing that market test, one of the things he learned was the fact that this myth of traditional medicine wasn't the primary driver, it was actually a carving market. His model is, if I sell rhino horn instead of $60,000 a kilogram, which you understand, if you're impoverished, why you would help poach a rhino for $600 a kilogram or $60 a kilogram, I can collapse the market demand for getting wild rhinos. If you eat shrimp, you may know that there's a challenge with wild-caught shrimp, which is called bycatch. This is a picture my wife took in the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua on a shrimp boat, and, and to the left of that barrier is, is the bycatch. To the right, what the arrow is pointing at is actually the shrimp that was caught. The bycatch will be thrown away, right? That is the impact of shrimp. So that's why I love this company, New Wave Foods, which has used red algae to create shrimp that looks like, tastes like, cooks like shrimp, but without the bycatch without the pollution of shrimp farming, without the trafficking in persons that's somewhat involved. And it's kosher, right? We now have kosher shrimp. <laughs> Move Free, now called Perfect Day, which is about 16 months from actually having a product on the market, 
created a way to brew milk like you would brew beer. And it is molecularly the exact same thing as milk, except you no longer have animal cruelty. You no longer have forest clearance, which is what you need for livestock. You no longer have the environmental footprint of feeding that livestock. You no longer have the methane production that comes out of cows, which is a major greenhouse gas contributor. And they took out the bad bacteria, lactose, and cholesterol. These are incredible things. They, they are not frankenfoods. They're actually opportunities for us to address these challenges that we have before us. We can address rates of change in new ways. And my friends started this company called Planet Labs because they wanted to disrupt NASA. And NASA, as you guys know, set up Landsat 8. Landsat 8, there are three guys, and I'll show you their picture in a second. But Landsat 8 uh, cost us $850 million to put into space. It took 10 years to build it. By the time you put technology into a satellite, it has to be space certified. It's already out of date. And it gives you 30 meter resolution of the planet every two weeks. These guys decided, we're going to build nanosatellites using the technology that is in your cell phone as opposed to inventing technology. So we benefit from the cost advantages. $40,000 a single nanosatellite, 17K to put into space. But what they would do is create a constellation of those satellites. Their hope was to ring the planet so you could actually get an image of the entire planet every day at three meters. And if this sounds like science fiction, well, on um, Valentine's Day, about less than three weeks ago, the, the Indian government put 88 of their satellites into space, the final set that's required to actually achieve that. So we now have the ability to actually understand rates of change. Scott Laurie was a PhD student of Stuart Pimm's here on this campus who created something called iNaturalist that has allowed individual citizens to help participate in monitoring of our environment. And if you think it's just an app, it was 2.7 observations, 104,000 species from 78,000 individuals who have participated in that. I wish when I was in Madagascar, I had that kind of scale in terms of what we're doing. And finally, we can think about restoration and resilience of the environment. And some things are pretty scary and kind of controversial. Ed Church has just announced actually within the last month that he believes his lab, he's at Harvard, to, is two years away from actually bringing back a mammoth, right? And that is because of a tool called CRISPR-Cas9 that gives us this incredible precision ability to edit the genome. And the genome uh, is, is one thing that has, uh, has, has actually increased our ability to understand and edit the genome, has increased faster in our technological prowess than, than, than Moore's law. Well, we may not want to bring back the mammoth to downtown Chicago. Could be, could be a really bad idea. But we do want to stop chytrid. And chytrid is a fungus that's wiping out amphibians all over the world. And it's so serious that the Smithsonian has taken this frog out of the wild because they're losing species. It is a fungus that, that literally prevents uh, respiration and the movement of, of necessary um, products across the skin barrier by thickening the skin barrier. And we're losing species. So if we can actually use a gene drive to wipe out the fungus that's also taking out trees in Hawaii that are endemic to Hawaii, we've got a chance of saving some of these species. The power of the microbiome gives us the ability also to, to combat novel diseases, to, uh, to think of a post-antibiotic world, to restore 20% of the earth that's currently degraded, to reduce pesticides in agriculture. The problem of conservation is conservationist. We really are at a point where the conservationists can best define the problem, but they no longer are in charge of all the solutions. And we got to move beyond that. And the same thing happened with global health. And in global health, we saw this where it used to be called tropical medicine, and it was made up mainly of white men in white suits who knew what all the answers were and what all the solutions were. But the fact is, they didn't. And it required bringing in engineers and economists and anthropologists to be able to actually make the gains that global health has made today. For us, Conservation X Labs, we're creating what, the world's first digital makerspace, a platform for mass collaboration to help invent new technologies to take on many of these problems. But it's not enough just to create a platform. 
it is actually really important to build a tribe. A tribe of conservationists, of conservation engineers, and conservation artists, and conservation makers, and conservation microbiome specialists, and conservation uh, anthropologists that were involved in working with us to help design these new technologies. And outside, after, the, after these talks, you'll actually meet one of the members of the Duke Technology Club on this campus, which is a group of engineers who are starting to take these problems on for the first time among any university campus. Much as humans have created these problems, we have the means to solve them. And I leave you with this image. If we can put this, this Volkswagen-sized rover, Curiosity, which is still crawling around the surface of Mars, using this crazy thing that was called the sky crane, Think of the engineering that went into that. Think of the ingenuity that went into that. We've got the ability to harness all of these tools, to harness all of us together to be able to address these conservation problems. Thank you.